through its fifth year, the United Nations drive hard against Nazi Germany and carry the attack at last even to the fatherland itself. Today, the energy of every German is consumed in total war, for now they know that their only defense against death from machines made by their enemy in America is to surpass American production. These plain-looking civilians have always been one of Hitler's most potent secret weapons. They help make this war possible, and they are the enemy we must ultimately defeat to finish it. In our duel against the worker behind the Nazi guns, the great force resisting us is his fierce devotion to his assigned task. Today, even at home, during his few hours off duty, the German worker is in the grip of the dictatorship that controls his life. A fury of propaganda exhorts the people to save themselves and the Nazi regime from the hell into which Nazi schemes have plunged them. They are hypnotized with official lies, but the trumpets of attack which shake Germany's very walls stir more sober workers to reflect uneasily on the fate of the Germany that used to be. The land the Nazis took over a dozen years ago was civilized and thriving. It was the leading industrial power of Europe. In Nazi hands, German industry was to be transformed into a fearful power for evil. But before Hitler, workers in plants like the great Krupp works were making steel for peace, for bridges, for modern homes, for automobiles, and for railroads. Germans had inherited a tradition of craftsmanship, and none could fabricate better the precision apparatus and delicate tools of science. German research dominated a worldwide network of patents and monopolies. And Germany's position at the crossroads of the continent was making her the commercial center of Europe. In the early 30s, the capital, Berlin, expressed the vigor of a democratic Germany, recovering slowly but steadily from the First World War. People lived a neat and ordered life for which Germans had always been renowned. Some enjoyed great riches. And though there was serious poverty, especially as the Depression came on, the needs of the frugal poor were somehow satisfied. To casual tourists, German nights seemed filled with music and good beer. But in the back streets during the early 30s, plain citizens were still haunted by the aftermath of 1918. Almost everyone had a plan for better days. The general restlessness often flared up. But the indulgent republic was content to let things ride. Increasingly appeared the brown shirts of a movement masquerading as a political party, which in the name of discipline promoted fascism. To all comers, the aspiring leader proclaimed that the last war had been lost by treachery at home, that to win the coming war, the German worker must be as strong as a soldier. Those who disagreed must be made to conform. Most did not agree.
but the Nazis bulled their way through. And in 1934, Adolf Hitler named himself absolute leader of the German Reich. Immediately, German industry began to shift from peace to war. One by one, in secret, factories were retooled. Workers whose unions had been destroyed found themselves drafted into making weapons for the army of Hitler's Germany. In 1936, their hard work bore first fruit when the reconditioned army moved into the Rhineland. No opposition came from a world too anxious for peace. Then, Hitler brazenly occupied his weak neighbors one by one. In triumph, he rode into Vienna. Back home, before the workers who had built it, and before alarmed observers from the outside world, the Führer paraded his war machine. Startling indeed was the strength of the Air Force, which had strained the German worker so that the Nazis could blackmail Europe. Using the threat of war as a trump card, the Axis partners ganged up on the democracies and dismembered Czechoslovakia. After Munich, many circuses spread before the German worker the glory of his handiwork. By following his leader, by training for work just as a soldier trains for battle, the worker had become in six years the most important little man in Europe. Those who had wavered could no longer dispute the Führer's policies, for he had almost doubled the size of the Reich. And then, Nazi arrogance goose-stepped into war. None was more amazed than the German worker when his panzer divisions erased Poland in 18 days. And none was more proud than he when shifting to the west, the Blitzkrieg cut through the Low Countries and over France with the precision of a well-practiced maneuver. Paratroopers along the roads they had just captured greeted German soldiers racing to Dunkirk and the Channel Coast. With a gay tune, we sail against England. Berlin rang with the same song for only a tiny island stood between the Hitler-crazed people and their most extravagant dreams. At last, the Luftwaffe was to have its day. But the small RAF stubbornly held its fragment of sky and proved that an assault on Britain would be more than a sideshow. To get minerals, food, and oil for his conquest of England, Hitler turned east. His war machine hammered at the heart of Russia. So imminent seemed victory that Japan rushed into the Axis game and at Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the war. German workers launched better than a submarine a day in a race to keep American products from taking effect on the battle line. When a skipper spotted a convoy, he radioed its position to headquarters in Germany. Other submarines were ordered into the attack area to form a wolf pack. The packs operated by secret tactics shown in this diagram. so heavy a toll that Allied shipping lanes were almost severed. Every German boy dreamt of becoming a submarine hero. But Nazi submarines ran afoul of the American Navy and the nation of workers behind it. And gradually these two, together with the other United Nations, forced the Nazis to give way.
feet in the Atlantic opened the sea lanes to convoys and brought the German worker to grips at last with his ultimate opponent, American industrial capacity and the American worker. The flood of steel across the Atlantic hardened the many battlefronts on which the Wehrmacht is now at bay. They must hold back advancing Russian army. In Italy, they must fight desperate delaying actions to stave off further retreat to the homeland. Under Himmler, many special divisions must be trained as hangmen for the rebellious people of the continent. The Luftwaffe is locked in deadly combat with air forces flying from England to lay waste the plants and factories of Germany. And while heavily engaged on all fronts, they must gird themselves to meet allied amphibious invasions. Today, as the Reich faces the war's sixth year, no longer can its people enjoy the illusion of world mastery. But the Nazis are nonetheless confident because Germany is still one of the greatest industrial powers the world has ever seen.